We are going to be looking at one verse in Romans chapter 5 this morning. It's going to be up here on the screen. We're just going to leave it up on the screen. If you want to open your Bibles, you're welcome to. I'm going to try to be brief this morning. And I know that all of you just kind of chuckled a little bit. Thank you, Suzanne. But we're really looking at, we're just looking at one, at one verse this morning. And we got a, a few things I want to I wanna look at with you in, in Romans 5, verse 10. I'm going to just give you a little bit of context here. Paul, when, when Paul makes this statement, he's, he's talking about why it is that we can have hope in Christ. Why it is that our hope in Jesus does not put us to shame. It does not disappoint us. It doesn't let us down. Why is that? Well, he says, because while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. I mean, that's the only kind of people there are. And, and a, a couple verses later, he says, he, he says, while we were still sin- God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, because Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and, and since that's the love that we have from God, and since we have been justified by his blood, Paul goes on to say, much more will we will be saved by Jesus from the wrath of God. Looking at the last day, and that leads us right up to verse 10 here. If, what, how do we know, how do we know that, that we, have, we have a real hope, not just wishful thinking? How do we know that we have a, a God who even wants to save us? Paul says, because of this. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Let's just talk about this verse a second. We were his enemies. We don't like to say it that way, but we were. We thought he wasn't good. We, we thought he was withholding. We thought he plays games with us. We followed other gods. We tried to make a name for ourselves. We even tried to deny that he exists altogether. In other words, we hated him. God came to us when we hated him. We don't like to admit it. But again, Christ died for the ungodly. There are no other people. So if you're thinking... If, if you want to be somebody, want to be considered something else, there's a warning there. Don't. Don't. That's the path of becoming a polished up group of church folk who, who come in here and live, live every other moment of their lives as though God's word doesn't really matter. We were his enemies. What's the, what's the next thing he says though? Why, if while we were his enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Do you ever sit there and wonder what God is actually like? Yeah. Um, I mean, the Bible says it all, uh, it talks about it all over the place, but still we sit here and we kind of wonder because we go through stuff in our lives and we feel like, I mean, maybe he's not there, maybe he's not watching, maybe he doesn't care. How do we, again, how do we know that God is even the kind of God who would want to save us and isn't just waiting for us to mess up so that he can pour out his wrath? Simply this. We were enemies, and while we were enemies, he reconciled us to himself by the death of his son. Reconcile reconcile just means he put the relationship back together. He put the relationship back together. And what is it that put that relationship back together? The death of his son. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? What kind of God is he? We say it is of central importance to us as Christians that we, that we affirm that God, there is one God in three persons. We call it the Trinity. God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What kind of God does this suggest he is? It suggests that, he is, uh, that God is the kind of Father who would put a relationship back together by sending his Son to die for us. 
It suggests that the Son is the kind of God who would love us and give himself for us. And it, it, it suggests that the Spirit is the kind of God that would empower the Son to make that kind of sacrifice in the first place. How do you know that God isn't just waiting for you to mess up so he can toss you away? How do you know? Because he not only gave his son, he not only gave his son up for you, but that very death is the way he, he, is what he used to put the relationship back together, to reconcile. While we were enemies, if that's what God does with the death of his son, Paul says, much more. Just imagine. Let your mind be blown by the thought. Will, will, much more will we be saved by Jesus' life. His life is much more. That's the much moreness of God. His death made our relationship right with God. His life makes us sons and daughters. His death changed our story. His life completes our story. I got to get an amen to that. Come on. Come on now. And get some noisemakers out if, you're, if, if nothing else. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If his death meant your relationship to God was put back together, if God did so much with the greatest injustice that could have been perpetrated upon his most beloved son, what do you think he's going to do with the life of his beloved son? That is, that he is risen is the proof that Jesus is able to save everyone to, who comes to him. That he is risen is the foundation of every promise that he has made to make all things new, to justify, to reconcile, to adopt, to restore, to overcome death and sin for all of eternity so that death gets no victory at all. Paul says at the, right, right at the end of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he says, Oh, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, oh, grave, where is your sting? Death gets nothing in the end. It's Jesus that we need. The gospel is good news. The gospel is great news. The gospel is Jesus. So being a Christian doesn't come down to just living the right kind of life or having the right morals. It doesn't even just come down to knowing all the right doctrines or knowing that you're going to go to heaven when you die. When you die. That's not what being a Christian is, is centrally focused on. It isn't glory, it isn't honor, it isn't wealth, it isn't health. It's not even, it's not even the holiness and the justification and the sanctification and the things that we, that we get from Jesus. It's Jesus who's able to give us these things. The living Jesus. The living Jesus in whom all blessings flow. He is alive. He is alive. Not just in spirit, not just as a moral example, not just in some spiritual feeling that we get. In no way do I mean that Jesus somehow just is, remains spiritually present with us. Or, or that the spirit of Jesus remains even though his body is dead. Or that there is some, some great nebulous spiritual thing out there that Jesus tapped into and we can tap into it too. I don't mean any of that. I'm saying that Jesus himself in history bodily got up and walked out of that tomb on the third day. And because of that I can say to you that all who come in faith will find life. All that the Father gives to him will never be cast out. Only a living Jesus can, can make that claim. He is our prize. He is our prize. That's why being a Christian is never about getting yourself cleaned up before you come. As much as we appreciate a shower before you come. It's not about making yourself respectable. It's not about making yourself presentable. It's not about being worthy to, of being in the presence of God. The, the gospel is simply this. Come to the risen Jesus in whom all blessings flow. 
He is able to save you to the uttermost. There is no one like him, and everything hangs on this one thing, every last bit of it. Every song that we sing, every hope that we have, any church community that we build here, every sacrifice we make, all our faith, all our hope, all our life, all our love, it all hangs on this one fact that Jesus is alive. So what do you make of this Jesus this morning? If you're a Christian, that, qu- that question is as much for you as if you're not. What are you going to make of this Jesus this morning? I'm saying this because, because we, we show up to church all the time looking for something other than Jesus. I'm not asking you to have the right feeling about Jesus today. I'm inviting you to come to Jesus. The living Jesus. And I can only make that invitation because uh, the Jesus who I'm talking about is alive and he makes that invitation. That's it. If you seek and find and believe that he is alive, then you will come come to find that everything else God says is absolutely true. That's the thing about, about being a Christian. We're hanging everything on this one thing. On, on something actually having happened. If he didn't walk out of that tomb, what we're doing here doesn't mean anything. That, that's what the Bible tells us. But since he has, we do have hope and faith and love that lasts. We have a hope that never di- disappoints, never puts us to shame. That, that stands whether you have had horrible, awful experience in church or in your family or in your background. That truth stands no matter where you come from, no matter how you identify yourself in this world. If Jesus is alive, then everything God says is true. Doesn't mean it's gonna, that it's easy. It means that it's true. And I invite you to come today to find that out for yourself. You have those, those little those sheets with the post-it notes on it, um, and you have some questions there. A- in a little while, uh, after we have communion, we're going to invite you to, po- to, to nail those things to the cross. And so, um, so be thinking about that, be praying about that, even as we, as we close and as we get into communion. But if you aren't sure about Jesus, then don't you think it's an important question of whether he he rose? Don't you think it's the most important question? Jesus, by his sovereignty and in his grace, has brought us together. Nobody comes here by accident. And everyone here, everyone here is welcome and is wanted. And you have been called here by God. And you have been called here to be confronted with Jesus. In whom all blessings flow. All you got to do is come to him. All you got to do is come to him. That's, I want you to know that that is so true for you Today, even if it's been 75 years since you, since you first came to know Jesus, that's more, probably, you're probably going to feel that that's more true for you today than it was then. The living Jesus is what you need. He is our prize. Amen? And he is alive. Oh, he is alive. Lord God, we are so, so grateful that you have You've gathered us here this morning, this Easter morning. We, we, we're so grateful that you have, that you raised Jesus up, that you made good on all your promises. You, Lord, Lord, you had promised to raise your people up. And you began that work in Jesus. And, and because of Jesus, we have access to it. Because of Jesus, we have a promise, an eternal promise and because of Jesus, we have hope. Lord, you are better than what we think you are. 
Lord, make this, this Easter morning, we ask that you would make it clear, open our eyes to it, change our lives by it. God, transform my life by it again. And make us, and empower us, and make us ready and willing and able to serve you with every moment of our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. It's the living Jesus that invites you. It's the living Jesus who invites you to this table this morning. That's the great thing about what he did on, on the night that he was betrayed. He, he, he gave his disciples a meal and said, this is how you're going to remember me. This is how you're, going to, how you're going to join with me again and again and again. It's going to be around a table. It's going to be around a dinner table. And I'm going to give you a feast. And I'm going to nourish you. I'm going to help you. It's going to define your past, your present, and your future. I love when we've become kind of a Pentecostal church here. This is great. This is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. We come remembering that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled God's law, even to death on the cross. And because he did, we are accepted. We can never, ever, ever be forsaken. You can't be forsaken because the living Jesus has a hold of you. And he's not letting go. And we come to commune with this same Christ. We come to be nourished by him in the present. Jesus is the bread that fills us and nourishes us and gives us strength. Jesus is the cup in whom we, is the vine in whom we have to abide if we're going to bear any fruit. Only a living Jesus can be these things for you. And only a living Jesus can give you his spirit, can give us his spirit to unite us into one body and make us one one people. And so that that we gather around this table in his love and in affection for one another. And only a living Jesus can give us a real hope, a hope that, that stands all else. That he will come, he will bring us to the day when our hope is, is turned to sight, our faith is turned to sight, our, praise, our prayers are turned to praise, our, what did I say the other night, our hope is turned into hallelujah, right? Only a living Jesus can do this, and he has, and he invites you to this table. He invites you to this table to feast on him. If you are not a Christian, or if, like, today can be the day. Can, today can be the day. And all it takes is you, is, is you believing what God says about Jesus, that he is alive. It will define everything else. That he is alive, that he is Lord. It will define everything else. But if that's not you today, that's, we're glad you're here. It's okay. We want you, we, we're going to say don't come to this table because you'd be, you'd be doing a lie. You'd be just carrying out a lie. We don't want you to do that. Just ask you to pray. And really pray. I think because Jesus is alive, I can, I'm, I'm confident that he will, <laughs> that he will answer those prayers. I love having our kids in here. I love this so much. The way we do this, we go to the go through the through the middle and around the sides. There's places to sanitize your hands. The elders will serve you. Uh, Please bring the elements back to your seats. If you need gluten free, those are in those little white cups, Um, and the the elders will will serve you. And you are welcome to bring your kids around if um, if your kids have professed faith in Christ, it, that's okay to, that they can come to the table too. If not, you just want, you just want like somebody to bless them. You know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to be right here. Just, just bring them by me and let, let me just quick give a prayer of blessing over them this morning. We have them in here for a reason.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Our Lord took bread. And after blessing it as, was, as he did in every meal, he, he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after dinner, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul tells us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The living Lord, my friends, the living Lord, he invites you to his table. So when you are ready, people of God, come.